Hola, muchísimas gracias por estar con nosotros en este espacio de Hey. Miren, yo suelo decirles que estoy emocionada, pero quizá a comparación de hoy no era nada. ¿Por qué? Porque estoy platicando y tengo el honor de traerles una entrevista con uno de los más grandes artistas, de los más grandes músicos que tenemos hoy en día. Eh, hay quien diría que la música pop, yo digo que la música en general, pop, rock, eh, lo que ustedes digan, es un honor estar aquí con, con Mika. Eh, gracias. Gracias a ti. Uh, we spoke, you speak four languages. Yes, I speak French, uh, English. <laughs> I'm like, which one do I speak? French, English, I speak Italian. I used to speak perfect it, uh, Spanish. Uh -huh. And then I had to do a TV show in Italy, which was X Factor. Yes. And I signed the contract without speaking any Italian, but I spoke Spanish. So then I had to learn Italian in about two months. So it gets mixed up. No, it just pushed the Spanish, because I don't know why. It was such an intense way of learning a language that it took a lot of the space that the Spanish had. But I know that if I studied Spanish even for like two weeks, I'd have it back, but I understand everything. Entiendo todo. Mika, uh, we're so excited to have you here. We've been speaking about how many fans you have. Uh, I, I told you you were here two years ago. You said no, it was like four or five, five years ago like for like 24 ago. hours. Yeah. Um, so this is really my first trip because here I'm here for five, six days. I'm going to do an acoustic show here. Um, I'm doing tons of different radio and stuff. But the nice thing is, in in the evenings, I have the evenings to myself. So. What does anybody with a heart and with half a brain do in Mexico City? Come 7 p.m. and they eat. <laughs> it's the best food in the world. So I've been just trying all the different restaurants and it's really a great city. What an amazing, amazing city. What an amazing uh, population as well in this city. And so I feel very welcome and I feel very like a fish in water in a way. I mean, I, I'm half Lebanese. Yes. So there's a temperament that has always been a little bit hotter than the northern European countries that I've always lived in. Right. And I've, in a way, I've always been at odds with the cultures that I found myself in. And my music is the result of that. It's this, this kind of mix of the Anglophile kind of ironic and the sense of humor. And, and then you've got this warmth that comes into the melody, which is more my Mediterranean side. And I've always confounded and confused a lot of northern European countries, you know, it, well, I always remember from the first day and even today, in the, when for my first album in the UK, mm -hmm. um, I had the most stellar five star reviews and the most disgusting, violent, <laughs> aggressive, offensive, borderline discriminatory uh, reviews that would give me one star only because they said that they didn't have the mechanics to give me none. Oh my God, was that, was that life in cartoon motion? Yes. But oh my the, God, the, that's the, the best record. But those record were record big record. journalists that I had grown up reading and so I kind of always had this kind of disparity, this polarized attitude to what I did. Yeah. And I knew that it was because my home was a Lebanese home in the context of, a Le of, a, of an English culture. I'm the result of all these things and I was always going to polarize. It only became really irritating when the journalists got younger and they turned into people that I had even gotten to school with. Of course. And then I'm just like, I want to kill you. Like, dude, what's going on? <laughs> but, but you're right. Here, I think there's a lot of uh, comprehension about the Middle Eastern co culture. Yes. I think there's a lot of things that, that we have in common. There's a lot of empathy. A lot of things that have to do with family, too. Absolutely. The, the concept of family, I work with my family. I come from a family of five. I still work out of my kitchen. If, you know, it doesn't matter who I'm working with from uh, Swatch, because we did, me and my sister designed for Swatch, we yeah. do it in my kitchen. They want to have a meeting with us, they have to come to the kitchen. Uh, if we're working with um, Valentino, Valentino, when they come and we want to discuss a new project, the two designers fly in, we sit in my kitchen and we eat, and either I cook or my sister cooks or my mother cooks. And it's this idea that the family and this nucleus is, uh, is, is a good area to develop things from. Absolutely. Now, I must tell you this, because I remember when Life in Cartoon Motion came out, uh, I know my experience, and that's what I can talk about, but I talked about it with a lot of friends. Uh, it has uh, such an amazing mix of the happiest, most euphoric music I've ever heard to the, the, so the saddest stories yeah. ever. So, the most depressing uh, music. I, but, I love that. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, Billy Joel says it's either sadness or euphoria in Summer Highland Falls. Absolutely. So Billy I, Joel was the master of that kind of happy sad, um, that kind of delicious melancholy, right. you know? I think you are too. 
Well, that's kind. I mean, I, I think that there's, I think that even in sadness, however, the, you, you have to have a sense of beauty. Um, and so even in the saddest song you've ever heard, which is what I say in, in a song called Last Party, which talks oh about my God. I want a to horrible that moment in, yes. in another artist's life, um, when he was basically handed a death sentence because it talks about Freddie Mercury when he was, when he found out that he was HIV positive um, and he, he locked himself in a nightclub and had this crazy party for three days with him and his friends, drugs, sex, alcohol, everything. That's how he reacted. So, and in the song it says, this is the saddest song you've ever heard. This is the saddest moment of your life, but let's dance, let's sing, let's party. And so there's this kind of like, very uh, kind of macabre, but quite tender sense of sad beauty. And I think that even in the saddest moments, there has to be a sense of beauty, and that's what makes it digestible. Again, I think that's why I've always kind of related to a lot of those, to a lot of literature that's come out of Latin America in general from those boom uh, authors, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, the kind of anyone the in particular? Gang. Well, everyone from Marquez to, to you know, the, 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 whole, the whole gang. It's just that sense of, of, of magic beauty. And, and even when it's melancholy, of course, it's, there's this certain thing that, of course, is slightly nostalgic and slightly chocolate box. But then again, that's not, it's not a bad thing either. And, and also, when you try a little Freddy, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know what you were in, We Will Rock You, right? No. Oh, I, is, that, is that a myth? It's a myth. It's a myth. I, it's because funny, I, I was I've, doing this yeah, like, hour, and a, hour and a half interview with, uh, on Alpha this morning yeah. on the radio station. And he was going on about how I was in We Were Rock You. I was like, no, you I've never not. been in We Were Rock You, ever. Because a lot of people compare your voice to Freddie's. That's a compliment. The, the, I'm friends with Roger Taylor and Brian May. And in the, the, like, in the beginning, they were like, oh, you want to come and sing a song with Queen? I was like, no. I have no intention of singing a song with Queen. I would never put myself in that context. Because, I'm a, I, like I always say, I'm a fan. Yeah. I'm, I entirely intend, I fully intend on staying a fan. There's only one way to ruin your fandom, is to get too close to something. You know what I mean? That's why I always say, like, I'm a huge fan of Billy Joel. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Rufus Wainwright. I don't want to meet them. I never want to meet Rufus Wainwright. Keep them away from me because I don't want it to be real. I've had experiences with another uh, legendary genius singer-songwriter from the same generation as Billy Joel and it really didn't go very well and I wish I hadn't done it. <laughs> I have a story for you. Um, a few years ago, I'm not even going to be able to try to tell time again, but uh, I went to London and I went to see Alan Cumming. Ah, Alan. I bought a blue car today. Yeah. And there was this song where he mashed a Dolly Parton song with my, with my interpretation. interpretation. I know, it's so weird. And then I got home. It was home. kind of genius. It, it was, actually, I love it. Then I got home, and Twitter was beginning. I was following you, and I heard that you were at the theater that day. Were you? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, you, you weren't? No, but it was he. Or you heard, or you heard about that song that day or something. No, I saw him that day. You saw him that day, I didn't yeah. go to the show because oh. I was... Good, yeah, I think I was, I was so on a TV that show, get to see but then it. I saw him afterwards. I think we played billiards and got drunk on beer and, <laughs> and in some restaurant in Chiswick. <laughs> no. Which is typical of Alan coming. You'll always have nights like that with Alan. Also, uh, I must tell you, um, as a fan of Wicked, and I know you're a good friends with Stephen Schwartz, yes. uh, the popular song has... Uh, I think that's one of the things people have gotten here a lot lately a lot. because Wicked opened two years ago here, or three yeah. years ago. And, it's popular, and I did it with Ariana Grande. I, originally, I did it with a songwriter, a genius young songwriter called Priscilla Renee, and we were just messing around in the studio. And... She was talking about how she was really bullied at school. And yes. you should see her. Like, this girl is, like, strong. She's funny. She's, like, written songs from everyone, from Rihanna to Madonna to, I mean, everyone. And uh, she's, like, 20-something years old. And she's like, yeah, I just got, you know, hammered at school. She was going on about how violent the, the, the bullying was for her at school. Right. I was like, oh, that's funny. It was kind of like that for me, too. And then, um, and... You know, uh, we came up with this line, and I said to her, uh, 
she she looked at me she goes you were the popular one the popular kids it is what it is now i'm popular bitch she said that yeah. and i replied sitting on the field with your pretty pom-pom now you're working at the movie selling popular con and, 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 then, comes in the, the song. and then we threw in popular and right. we just used it and i sent it to steven and i was like will you by any chance because he'd rejected kanye from using the song oh, thank God. He rejected, no, he rejected so many people from using the sample. And I was like, please, do you think, is there a chance, maybe? And he heard it and he was like, you understood. You know, I felt like that too when I was younger. Yes, you can have the song. Do whatever you want with it. Just one more question because our time is almost up. And, uh, but I need to know the story in, it, in any other world. Um, who is she? I, I always imagine her she's a lady. your grandmother. No, she's not my grandmother. She's a very complicated woman. Uh, again, like, you know, there's nothing simple about anyone in life, and she's a perfect example. She's someone who um, used to hang out at her house. We had a lot of people growing up who just hung out at the house. One of the people that hung out at the house is now 97 and lives in our house. Okay. And because she's too old now, and she just decided to live with us. <laughs> But we have, you know, loads of different people that used to live with us. And I have to say, this one was, uh, she had one eye, and she lost her eye in a bomb in, in the war in Beirut during the Civil War. Uh, but it left her with these scars, and also she's really conflicted as to who, nowadays, she's a woman who's very conflicted, and um, it's very angry in quite a, in quite a violent way about the, the, the situation in the Middle East. Um, and so I wrote... I wrote Any Other World, which doesn't cast any judgment, doesn't say who's right, who's wrong. It just shows how everything can be thrown upside down. Um, and that even when something bad happens to you, you're still not safe. Like you're still, there's still worse things that can happen to you if, if, you, if you let the anger take over. And I was like, in any other world, uh, even when you lose your family, you lose your, lose your life, you lose your parts of your body, but the anger still doesn't let you see clearly and you can't heal. I was like, in any other world with a little bit more distance, uh, we could tell the difference and we could organize ourselves properly. But for now, we can't, so we give in. And it's quite a, a, a hopeless lyric. And it's, uh, I never really actually talk about her. It's the first time I've ever spoken about who she is. Because it's not, she's not great. She's not bad. She's not good. She's just complex. She's one of us. <laughs> she's one of us. Thank you, Mika. It's... Um... It's been such an amazing talk to, with you. Uh, I wish you were more part of our lives here, but you are with your well, music. I'm starting now. Well, I'm we back. won't let you go. And I'm going to be coming back a lot more. You have no idea how many people love you here. That's so very kind to say You'll figure so. it out. Thank ah, you. Me one of them. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this. Y muchísimas gracias a ustedes. Es una entrevista con los grandes, grandes músicos que existen. Ah, gracias. Gracias a ti, querida Mika. Y con eso nos quedamos por hoy. Sigan pendientes de todos los espacios de G&M Milenio Televisión.